Hello and welcome. Mexico finds itself at the front line of a battle that has spiraled out of control. Over the past year, a vicious drug war has claimed over 7,000 lives, furthering social instability and weakening an already ailing economy. Earlier this year, a Pentagon study found that the country was on the road to becoming a failed state. Poor economic growth has forced millions of Mexicans to illegally move to the United States to find work. And unless the violence can be reversed, the U.S. can expect a continued flow across the border. While Mexico battles its internal problems, bilateral tensions with its northern neighbors loom. On Thursday, U.S. President Barack Obama travels to Mexico City, but analysts say that the stopover is a clear signal of support for President Felipe Calderon, as the two countries grapple with the deadly flow of drugs and weapons across their borders. On today's show, we ask, how can Mexico overcome escalating drug wars and an ailing economy? Remember, you can join our conversation with your questions and comments. Log on to livestation.com forward slash AJE Enter the chat room and you can take part. We also welcome your phone calls on the show. Well, joining me from Mexico City to examine these issues is Dr. Denise Dresser, Professor of Political Science at the Instituto Tecnologico Autonomo de Mexico. She's the author of numerous publications on Mexican politics and U.S.-Mexico relations and associate editor at large for the uh, Los Angeles Times. She's currently on the board of Human Rights Commission for Mexico City. Dr. Dresser, thank you very much for joining us there. I know you have a windy and rainy uh, climate and appreciate you taking the time out to uh, discuss this issue with us. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, I want to start off by asking you about, uh, uh, well, asking you a question I've asked in the past of people. Whose war is this? Is this Mexico's war or is it the United States' war? I think it's a shared war. It's a war that is being fought largely on Mexican soil, but it's a war that's motivated by drug consumption in the United States, one of the largest markets for drugs in the world. O over 35 million Americans are consumers of drugs. And at the same time, the United States is providing most of the weapons that drug traffickers are using in this country to fight policemen, kill civilians, and fight each other in a battle over turf. So although the bloody side of the war is ours and we're paying a high price for American veracity, it's clear that the root cause causes of this war lie in the United States and hopefully Barack Obama will address that issue and also come here with a position of shared responsibility. I was wondering exactly, I was going to ask you exactly what you think that Mexico is looking for from President Obama when he makes his trip over. I mean, presumably it is just more than that, that promised military support under the uh, Merida initiative. Well, Hillary Clinton was here a couple of weeks ago, and she espoused the language of shared responsibility. And I think with that position, she managed to placate many Mexicans who had been feeling abused by very critical coverage in the United States of what's happening here. However, I think Mexicans, as the polls show, would like the American government to move beyond the rosy rhetoric and actually uh, show some concrete steps and advances in terms of what is fueling this drug war, what I mentioned earlier, the issue of consumption. And I think more importantly, at this specific juncture for the Mexican government, a commitment on the part of the United States to deal with the flow of weapons across the border. More has to be done on the American side. And I think that Felipe Calderón will raise the issue of um, the assault on the, the ban on assault weapons, which, as you know, expired in 2004. And many officials in the Mexican government believe that since that ban was repealed, that uh, people buying weapons in the United States have been able to do so more freely, thus providing Mexican cartels with the ammunition to wage a fierce battle against each other and against um, political structures in this country. Interesting you mentioned that issue of weapons. We had an email from our viewers around the world uh, on this from Adolfo Talpalar, who's in, uh, uh, Talpalar sorry, who's in Stockholm in Sweden. He wrote in saying, President Obama should concentrate on reducing arms smuggling from the U.S. to Mexico. These are the weapons used by the cartels against the Mexican security forces. A coordinated action between Mexico and the U.S. may put an end to this serious binational threat. Now, uh, that, that flow of weapons, you were talking about the assault, uh, assault weaponry uh, issue, but in terms of how easy those weapons are flowing across, has anyone looked at uh, possible ways of stopping that flow? 
Well, it begins really with the facility with which people can buy weapons in the United States. And I know that Mexican, many conservative American politicians don't even want to discuss this issue because they believe that the, the right to bear arms is consecrated in the American Constitution. I don't think any Mexican would argue against that, but I think what we are trying to say is that it has to be harder for um, straw dealers, for people who are, uh, who are paid by the cartels to just walk into arms fairs and be able to buy weapons very freely. There was an interesting case, uh, an attempt to prosecute a weapons seller in Arizona recently who had been selling hundreds of weapons to straw dealers hired by the cartels. Uh, Terry Goddard, the attorney general in Arizona, attempted to bring a case against this man, and the case was subsequently dropped by a judge, setting a precedent of how hard it is to convict people who are selling weapons willingly, knowing that they are going to end up in the hands of drug traffickers. So I think it has to start there. And it may have to go back to the issue of the ban on assault weapons. This is a political um, hot potato in the United States. I know that Eric Holder and Hillary Clinton have said that, uh, they, that, that the U.S. government at this point, that the Obama administration does not intend to use political capital to resurrect that ban, that there's no appetite for it in Congress. But I think that if that ban is not put into place again, uh, the efforts to stop the weapons once they've been sold, to stop the flow across the border, is going to be uh, very difficult to carry out because the border is so long, so wide, so porous. As you know, thousands of people cross it every day, and according to official estimates, there was a recent report by the Brookings Institute that stated that 2,000 weapons, American, bought, w w American uh, weapons, are uh, cross the border daily into Mexico. Dr. Dresser, you know, it's interesting you mentioned that. We had another email that came in, if I may put this one to you. This is from, uh, uh, actually, well, let's listen first to what the Mexican ambassador uh, had to say on this, uh, on this issue, the Mexican ambassador to the USA, Arturo Sarucan, on this issue of weapons. I think the key issue right now is how can the United States help to shut down those guns and shut down that bulk cash that is providing uh, the drug syndicates in Mexico with the wherewithal to corrupt, to bribe, to kill. Ninety percent of all weapons we are seizing in Mexico, Bob, are coming from across the United States. Just on the Arizona and Texas borders with Mexico alone, there are approximately 7,000 FFLs, Federal Firearms Licensees, and a lot of the weapons that are being bought by the drug syndicates, either directly or through proxy purchases, are coming from those gun shops. Dr. Dresser, there's, uh, there was Arturo Sarukan, the uh, Mexican ambassador to the U.S., talking on Face the Nation, on, reflecting some of the things you've said there. An email that came in from the United Kingdom, from Derek Bernard, had this to say. The claim that illegal guns flow from the U.S. to Mexico is nonsense. It is a com convenient, and, uh, convenient red herring intended to divert attention from the fact that the war on drugs is an appalling, disastrous policy failure. Legalize all drugs and the driving force of huge profits would destroy the cartels and dramatically reduce the violence in Mexico. It would also have a huge benefit in the USA. Is that even an option? Well, I mean, personally, it's a policy that ad I would advocate. I don't think it's, it, 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 it has any legs at this point. It's a political non-starter, both in the United States and Mexico. President Calderón has said that he is not contemplating the decriminalization of drugs, despite the repeated pleas from, for example, prominent uh, former Latin American presidents, Ernesto Cedillo, César Gaviria, Fernando Enrique Cardoso, who put together a report recently pushing for the legalization of marijuana for personal consumption, believing that that would make a much better contribution than uh, trying to address the symptoms but not the causes of this, uh, uh, of, of the, the increased flow of drugs across the border. Uh, I, I don't think that the Obama administration is contemplating decriminalization uh, on a national basis at, at this moment in time, although you're beginning to see uh, efforts at, decriminal, at decriminalization at the state level. In New York, for example, in California, where uh, I think policymakers have begun to understood to understand that if, if you can continue to place more emphasis on combating drug traffickers than on dealing with consumption issues.
issues, that this is a war that will never be won. And I, I guess I, I would go further than what the person in the email suggested. Um, not that, not that, that um, trying to limit drugs is a, is a red herring, but it doesn't go to the heart of the matter. Trying to limit weapons, I mean, is, mm -hmm. it doesn't go to the heart of the matter. The, the problem is that drug trafficking in Mexico builds upon a very corrupt political structure. It builds upon a country with very weak institutions. And as I said, we're paying a price for American veracity, but we're also paying a price for our inability to construct a country where the rule of law is actually a reality. Ambassador Sarukan talked about the capacity of drug traffickers to corrupt Me Mexican institutions. That's a very easy thing to do in a country with a per capita income of less than $7,000 and where a police officer earns less than $500 a month. So I think that um, ultimately our own battle doesn't have to be so much against drugs, although that is important, but Mexico's challenge in the future is building a solid institutional network where police become the authority that you seek once a crime is committed and not the people you elude when that's the case. Mexico is a country where 98% of crimes are never solved and where 85% of crimes are never even denounced due to lack of trust in the authorities. And I think drug trafficking simply builds upon that culture of impunity. Dr. Dresser, we have more questions for you. We're going to touch more on the issues you're raising here uh, in a moment when we begin, uh, continue our discussion. As we pause, let me remind you, you can join the conversation with your questions and comments by logging on to livestation.com and entering the chat room. You can see there's a debate taking place there right now. We're also taking a poll in the chat room where we're asking, what does Mexico need most from President Obama? Log on and voice your opinion. We'll be right back. Get up the top, don't let me get up.